by the year 2000, catastrophism is now pretty much an accepted paradigm okay. in Earth history, but not necessarily in human history. No, no, not the, yet. This is well. now, I would say, is the next evolutionary development in catastrophism. Yeah. Is recognizing its role in our human story on Earth. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Ben and welcome to another Uncharted X podcast. This one is a special one for me as I had the chance to sit down for a couple of hours with Randall Carlson, which is something I've hoped to do for many years now. Randall is an architect, he's a researcher, a teacher, and he's a well-known intellectual who is incredibly well-versed in many diverse fields. Things like earth history, geology, climate science, glaciology, ancient civilizations, sacred geometry, esoteric traditions, and just many more. He's appeared on the Joe Rogan podcast a number of times, and Graham Hancock has directly described him to me as someone who is, quote, in fact, a genius and he's someone that I've greatly respected and admired for a long time. This discussion gets into several topics, and we start with what led Randall onto the path of trying to solve some of the planet's biggest mysteries. We go on to discuss the history of catastrophism versus gradualism when applied to Earth science, the end of the last ice age, and the Younger Dryas. And Randall describes several of the dynamics of the many mega flood landscapes that come from that period. Things like the channeled scablands, which you are seeing footage of here. After that, we get into the impact of catastrophism, or rather the lack of it, onto the orthodox history of human civilization. We talk about the sun in some detail, as well as the impact of the cosmic environment onto climate change and the current narrative that surrounds that contentious topic. I've got timestamps of topics in the description below, along with plenty of links to more information. I want to say many thanks to Randall for giving up some of his time to speak with me, and I really hope that you all enjoy this conversation, as I certainly enjoyed having the chance to speak with him. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the podcast. This is Uncharted X. My name is Ben, and I am just thrilled and honoured to be joined by Randall Carlson today, somebody I've wanted to speak to for quite some time. How you doing, Randall? I'm doing great, Ben. Yeah, it's great to see yeah, you. Yeah, I'm happy to report. I'm doing great. <laughs> yeah, that's that is that's excellent. I know you. Sometimes been... people ask me how I'm doing, and I have to kind of fake it. <laughs> but these days, it's generally going pretty good most of the time. That's, that's what we like. That is excellent. I wasn't going to ask you what's up, although uh, although I did love your response to that on one of your podcast episodes. That's uh... <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if I can remember it. Yeah, we got Randall here with us. What's up, Randall? What's up? Well, uh, it's the exact reverse of the vectoral summation of all terrestrial gravitational forces. <laughs> of course, it has to be uh, referred to a specific set of geographical coordinates because obviously what's up to us is not what's up to the Chinese. That's right. That's... So, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Let it be known I remember to stop now, saying that. We are not <laughs> flat Earth believers. <laughs> yeah, what's up? It was actually technically accurate though it was yeah yeah that's right break it down <laughs> indeed yeah well as 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 i think most of the things you say are which is you know one of the reasons i've wanted to, to speak to you for so long i've i've been a huge just a huge fan of your work i, I can't tell you how much that this the stuff that you have online and and available both in the podcast but also on the on your channel the uh you know um geocosmic rex just i've been I, I've spent so many hours going through all that, all, all of that material. It's uh, it's been a real inspiration for for me along my little sort of journey of going down the rabbit hole, investigating kind of you know the the, the history of the planet and civilizations and all that kind of thing. Yeah, there's a it's an interesting story that's unfolding. It certainly is. It, it feels like it's continually unfolding. Then there's just oh, it is day by day. The new science that comes out keeps kind of peeling it back. It's for accelerating. Me. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, I got to say that I'm. I I, I watch those videos, I, and I just love the ones from. I think it must have been the early two thousands or thereabouts. And I'm just I'm so jealous of the people that were sitting in that classroom in uh, in uh, it must have been in Atlanta somewhere. And you know, just having you, I think you're doing a lot of sort of forming a lot of those theories and, and testing it out on them. I just yeah, I, yeah. on those yeah, guys. even into the nineties into the, oh back into the nineties too. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. But you know, hearing you say that, it makes me want to go back and. 
to those people and say, now, listen, did you get people appreciate what was happening back then? Yeah. Right. You realize what you were privy to? Indeed. Well, that's that's the thing when it comes to the younger dryers, which I think most of the audience for, for my podcast would be familiar with, as they'd be familiar with you, because I, I talk about both you and the younger dryers quite a bit uh, in my work. But I mean, you, you have essentially predicted kind of some of the things that is now been discovered and is coming out in the peer-reviewed papers ever, ever ever since 2007 with Firestone and West and and that first paper that came out really looking at the the evidence for you know impact and impact proxies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I pretty much you know it's it's catastrophism is something that uh, seized my interest at very early. I mean you know yeah I was still barely out of high school right when I started getting into. I think you know I put it to summer of '70 and in spending the whole summer. I've talked about this, but, you know, hiking and camping and, and traveling right. throughout the Western states, I just got obsessed with geology. Right. But the, the, with the, as far as the younger Dryas, it was like I'd been following catastrophist thinking for probably, you know, a decade or two and realizing that most catastrophist thinking was pretty much being ignored. I mean, if we go back to the 70s, you know, 50s, I was – you know, too small, but at that right. point, <clears throat> catastrophism pretty much centered around the work of Velikovsky, Emanuel yep. Velikovsky, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Yep, sure am. But of course, he was considered a total crackpot. Right. And there were others. You know, Hapgood, I kind of think of Charles Hapgood, if you're familiar with him and his, yeah, crustal plate shifting theory. And, you know, his, he was probably the most dominant catastrophist, I think, in the, in the 60s and 70s. There were others, certainly. Right. Um, but what the problem was is they were all considered fringe because they yeah. did not fit the uniformitarian paradigm. Right. As, as same with, with J. Harlan Bretz, you yeah. know, decades earlier, <clears throat> because he did not fit the, the uniformitarian paradigm. He was, he was not so much ignored as he was, uh, he was looked upon as, as a heretic. Right. And he had to be basically exposed as a heretic so that his heretical ideas could not contaminate, you know, established geological dogmas about the history of the earth Yeah, and what was uh, or not allowed to happen. But yeah. in any case, I guess when I really started, you know, obsessive, obsessing over catastrophism would have been between the mid to late seventies. Okay. <clears throat> because the things I had seen, in the Western states, just trying to explain what am I looking at here, particularly what stands out in my mind was the, the trip through the Columbia Gorge. Right. And and looking at those landscapes, thinking, what what is that? You know, yeah. there was like two parts of me. One is just like, well, who knows? Who have <laughs> could have any idea? This is it's just there. You don't, you know, a hill is just a hill, a valley is just a valley. There was another side of me that was like, yeah, but what is this big flat thing splayed out from that valley mouth? Right. You know, what is that? You know, what what is this, you know, seeing those sheer waterfalls yeah. like uh, Multnomah Falls or, or or Oneonta, which at the time I, I didn't remember the names of, but I've, I've revisited many times since then. But, you know, that was kind of what got me going. And then um, I would say by 80, 1980, when the Alvarez team – and several others came out with the idea that the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, the, the dinosaur yeah, the mortality event was triggered by a bolide, an asteroid from space. Right. Totally electrified me because I was one of those boys in the fifties that was obsessed with dinosaurs. Sure. I was everything about dinosaurs, <laughs> anything and everything dinosaurs, uh -huh. at least until I got to my adolescence and then, <clears throat> My interest had shifted from dinosaurs to, well, you can imagine what most adolescent, <laughs> adolescent boys, boys. <laughs> yeah, that I was, I fell victim to that. Temporary distractions. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were many distractions once I got to middle school. Anyways, sure. we won't go there. Um, <laughs> but for years, I was just obsessed with dinosaurs. So I've told this story, but I had this, this view master toy. Yeah. It yeah, had this, this reel of these dinosaurs, um, and, and it was taken from a, a, a 50s movie called um, Animal World, and it had a sequence in there about the dinosaurs, and it was animated by um, Ray Harrahausen, who was the sort of the doyen of, of, 
uh, 3D animation back. I don't know if you're familiar with the old stop motion process. Oh, yeah, yeah, I am. In fact, I even had a, a viewfinder as a kid too. I'm uh, yeah, yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. So yep. it had this sequence that was a series of what was it, 21 still images in 3D that was this dinosaur sequence out of this movie, Animal World, that had been uh, animated by Ray Harrahausen, right? And so, uh, anyways, it ends with a catastrophe. You know, at the last few scenes, the sky is red on fire. The, the ground is opening up. The dinosaurs are falling into it. Right. And that, my little view master, that was almost like a religious icon well, item to me, you know, it, 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 to, when I was a kid. It's almost a biblical description, you might say, even. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I used to actually, like, sometimes fake being sick so I could stay home and I would be the only one home alone. I would go in my room. I'd pull out my my little view masters, and I had some other things in there, too, that were <laughs> sure. almost of equal interest, right? Uh-huh. Just the blinds, get just the right light in there, prop yeah. the pillows up, get on my bed, and the next four hours I'd be just absorbed in this 3D world. Wow. But it always ended with the dinosaurs. I would go through the sequence. It was, you know, the, uh, the, the Arabian Nights. Mm-hmm. It was Jules Verne. It was yeah, yeah. Um, Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Uh-huh. Which, by the way, curiously, was all about the discovery of a lost civilization that had left a message that had once been occupants of, I don't remember the name, the planet that exploded or disintegrated that was between um, Mars Mars and Jupiter where the asteroid asteroid belt belt, is. Right. Right. So that was the theme of one of the stories. And that was, um, you know, they they find this... um, what was there? There was um, asteroid miners, and they find this capstone. And as the story goes, and the story actually was written by Willie Lay, who was a really interesting guy back then. Okay. Not to get into old Willie Lay, but he <laughs> was he was definitely a forward thinker. He was he was ahead of his time in, in imagining things about, um, for example, is there an interstellar life? Is there cosmic civilizations? And so he put this story into this Viewmaster set that was basically um, that they had found a, uh, a, uh, a tetrahedral, hmm. tetrahedral pyramid on the moon missing a capstone. Huh. Or was it the other way around? Anyways, they bring the capstone and they put it on the, the truncated tetrahedron. And mm-hmm. as soon as they do it becomes translucent or transparent and it's a holographic map of Mars. Now this, this story actually still have that same Viewmaster reel. It was, it was published in 1951. Wow. But so they put the (laughs) capstone on the tetrahedron. It becomes transparent and there's a three dimensional holographic map of Mars showing where to go to find this time capsule. that has been left on Mars from this advanced civilization with secrets of anti-gravity and all of this kind sure. of stuff. So yeah. under the left pole of the Sphinx, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it was under a, a Sphinx. And so they go to Mars. It's out in the desert of Mars. And there's a Sphinx there with a lion's head. And they have to probe under the Sphinx. And they find this chamber under the Sphinx. And it's got this. Yeah. So yeah. if somebody really says, well, and People ask me all this, how did you get into this stuff? I mean, when did it start? If I have to push it back to my earliest, I'd say it was that. Yeah. It was getting those, would have been March 26, 1956. Okay. So I turned five years old, and wow. my birthday present was my Viewmaster with these reels. And just open up your imagination, and, and, and away we go, right? And away <laughs> we go, yeah. But what it was in this big circuitous route when I come back to the idea of, of the cata- catastrophic end of the dinosaurs yeah, was the key to this thing. See, so I had nurtured this interest in dinosaurs. I used to pride myself on being able to identify every dinosaur, whether it was an herbivore or a predator and, you know, whether it was um, uh, Jurassic or whether it was Cretaceous. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyways, um, Came back around 1980. <clears throat> Papers come out proposing that the dinosaurs had been killed by an asteroid impact. Right. And that just fired me. And right. at that point, I got really, I'd always been interested in astronomy. Growing up in rural Minnesota, wow, yeah. you go out the night, it's 
there, you know, it would, there yeah. it was. Yeah. Yeah. So I, in particular, I remember cold winter nights where it's a super clear, we lived on a lake and I could go out ice skating on the lake, like at 10, 11, 12 o'clock. If it's, you know, winter night over, probably over Christmas vacation mm-hmm. and I'm 13, 14, 12 years old. And the stars are just, in fact, there was one year where it got cold before it snowed and the lakes froze. Typically, it would start snowing about the time the lakes froze. So when the lakes froze over, you would have this, the texture of the ice would be really rough. Right. right? But this year it was a late snowfall. So it had gotten cold. The lake had frozen. So it was like a sheet of glass, reflective wow. glass. And wow. I remember, I think it was, I think it was probably winter of 64 three or four, five, maybe I was 13 or 14 years old. Right. And I had gotten a pair of ice skates for Christmas. <laughs> I had those ice skates on and I'm headed out and I'm going skating across this lake. I'm in the middle of the lake skating and beautiful, clear night, stars, just intense right yeah. there. And then the whole ice sheet was just like a big mirror. Yeah. So it was like the sky above and the sky below. And I'll never forget that. And And that was really... So see, that triggered this interest in astronomy, the stars and all. So then I got to the point where I could identify, you know, probably 20 different constellations. I could instantly go out and find a North Star and, yeah. you know, show off because, you know, if you need <laughs> to find your way, you find the North Star, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Well, 1980s, it was like, <clears throat> boom, this, a bunch of this, these things, these interests, these lifelong interests we'll just sort together. of spark. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So then... I always look at 1980 as a turning point in the um, in the evolution of, of geological thinking, because if you go back to the early days of geology, they were almost all catastrophists. Right. You know, the founding fathers of yeah. geology, in 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 varying ways, but they were pretty much all catastrophists. And some of those names that would be, you know, Cuvier, uh, William Buckland, Agassiz, you know, who basically he didn't invent the idea of the ice ages, but he was essentially the one who made the, uh, an acceptable scientific concept. Um, right. Adam Sedgwick, Roderick Murchison. I mean, the list could go on. If you read their stuff, they were all catastrophists with the advent of Lyellian uniformitarianism, right. Charles Lyell followed by, was it James Playfair and, and it was James Hutton and, and Playfair. Maybe it was William Playfair. It was those three guys, essentially, who codified this concept of uniformitarianism. Gradualism. The yeah. idea that you learn about the past by reference to processes that are currently happening. Right, the gentle erosion <clears throat> that we see taking place over time, right? Was this, was this, it's a really interesting area because was this, was this done as a, in, in an attempt to sort of distance themselves from the catastrophism of religion at the time, given all yes. the biblical stories? That's exactly right, Ben. That's exactly it. It was like they were distancing themselves from, from fundamentalism, from biblicalism, from the younger earth ideas. Right. Because this is at the it, same it time flooded. now when the ideas are evolving of a much older earth. Right. And so you have this now this conflict between the, 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 the ecclesiastical model of earth history and the scientific, right. the emerging scientific model. Yeah, I, 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 it feels like to me that pendulum it swung it swung all the way away from it, and now it's it, it's it went too far, and it's it feels to me like we're still in the process of bringing it back to where it needs to be. I mean, start you know, Brett's, and then you have been a big part of this, and it's one of the questions I have is how how that how is that battle going in terms of just specifically with geology? I think it's it's it primarily applies to geology in in that case, but it's you know it, it's. I, I don't know if, if is that is it coming back? Do you think there's it's it's swinging back towards you know more accepted ideas of of catastrophism or uh, well in terms of process? You know, actually, the you know, the things you've just said there's there's multiple um, dimensions to what you just said. <laughs> sure. um, what you just asked, um, you know, part of it is we have to recognize the role of politics yeah. in science. Right. That's a big part of it. Huge. Um, I do think that the pendulum has come back. Yeah, I mean the dominant the dominant idea uh, for the 20th century of, of Earth change and Earth history was uniformitarianism, gradualism, right. and and yes, one grain of sand, one drop of water at a time. Given enough expansive duration of time, you can accomplish all kinds of things, right? right. And so 
there were obviously exceptions to that. We mentioned Jay Harlan Bretz. He was probably the big exception in his work in the, the first half of the 20th century yeah. and his introduction of, of the catastrophic floods. And that certainly is worth talking about yeah. in uh, more depth because basically what happened was he was proposing something that completely was outside the bounds of the uniformitarian paradigm, right? Right. When his idea of the floods were finally accepted, it was because the geological community essentially came up with a way of 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 torturing the, the the flood catastrophes into the uniformitarian model. Yeah, multiple floods, right? Multiple was, floods, yeah. yes. Now, there were multiple floods. Right. There absolutely were multiple floods. When you go into the into that landscape, you're seeing the events, you're seeing the evidence of multiple massive flows of water. However, there's there's a however in there, see? Um those multiple floods, what I'm arguing and have been arguing for at least 20 years now, is that those multiple floods do not represent, tw you know, multiple reformings of Lake Missoula behind multiple ice dams. Right. See, that's where I'm, and I'm also suggesting that if we really look at what, what we're seeing there, is what we have to do is look at those floods, and th this is what doesn't seem to be happening, because what they're doing is essentially kicking the can upstream. Sure. Okay, so here was all of this water that swept over southeast Washington, stripping away hundreds of feet yeah. of lusial topsoil, exposing the basalt bedrock of the Columbia Basalt Plateau, right? Gouging out uh, coolies that are 800, 900, 1,000 feet deep. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, a mile to five miles wide. We're talking about multiple flows of 300, 400, 500 million cubic feet per second, right? Yeah. It's all coming out of this lake. Right, this lake, which is holding over 600 cubic miles of water, held in behind an ice dam. The lake at the ice dam is 2,100 feet deep. That's a the pressure at the base of that water column is going to be in excess of 900 pounds per square inch. Now, yeah. if we use the uniformitarian model, if we use the uniformitarian um, analysis. What we would then do is we would look and say, okay, where is the modern analog for something like that? And there isn't one. The closest you can come with is that there are modern floods that are caused by water backing up behind an ice dam, right? Mm -hmm. They're pretty, they're quite catastrophic. They're, I mean, they're regionally catastrophic, locally, locally catastrophic yeah. in Iceland um, is where you find a, the, the preeminent example. Right. And Jokalops is the, is the Icelandic term for these glacial outburst floods. Here's the thing, though. When you start looking at those glacial outburst floods and you start looking at peak discharge, you start looking at, at, at uh, the, the total magnitude and volume of, of lakes, you're basically looking at the largest ones being around one one thousandth right. of the flows of the Missoula floods. And and they so break they break they, they break down well before reaching any of those types of pressures either right that's they can't reach that depth and sustain that type of pressure. There is no case of any glacially dammed lake reaching anywhere close to that kind of depth or pressure. Yeah, or span and, and either, see, right? Or span. Yeah, like the, a, the, the, the valley. The, the it would have spanned at the base of the valley. It would have been about five miles wide in the yeah. Clark Fork River Valley, at the four thousand two hundred feet above sea level. Which was the, the the high water mark? It was seven miles across the that's, valley. That's a long bridge. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and when you look at ice, um, ice glacial ice is a porous medium, right? You know, it's 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 filled with fissures and cracks and moulins that 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 you know. I mean, basically, in a springtime, oftentimes in the glaciers, many study many of these studies, water will pool up on the surface of the glacier. And it'll the pool will will continue to deepen, and usually it never gets more than a few feet deep. Maybe in some places, if there's a depression in the glacial ice, it might get more than that. But typically, it'll pool up, and somewhere within a, a month or two, it will find some egress. It'll find some way through the ice, and it drains. And and you you never see it get beyond you know typically a few thousand cubic feet per second peak discharges would be typical. Um, there have been Yokel Alps in Iceland where you'll have a large reservoir of water forming under the glacier because the volcano is erupting under the ice sheet, right? Yeah. 
you'll, you'll have 30 miles, for example, one of Vatna Yoka, if I'm pronouncing it exactly correctly, I'm probably not, but is about 30 miles set back from the margin of the glacier. Right. Typically within uh, 10 days to three weeks from the eruption, that reservoir of water will have forced its way through the ice and it will at that point discharge at the, mar- at the margin of the ice and then you'll have the outburst flood. Sure. And of course, these pressures are two orders of magnitude less than the pressures we're talking about for that in, in, in Missoula. See, so yeah. that my point in all of this, I guess, is that what I what I would say has happened is that there's this dogma now um, that you have multiple lakes, mul- multiple floods, which then implies multiple ice dams, which then implies multiple lakes. Nice. And I've been attacked by several uh, geologists that ha- that can, that are considered experts on the flood and mm-hmm. and I would mostly agree with their research in the field I've read all their papers but have in several occasions been attacked and of course what it is is they somehow have got the idea that I'm advocating well there was only one flood yeah well I've never advocated that but what I am saying is that we actually have to understand that there's several thresholds of, of flood levels that have occurred. And the biggest, the very biggest floods were probably very at the maximum three, maybe two. Yeah. And there where we're talking about flows in the hundreds of millions of cubic feet per second. But see what they've done by going Lake Missoula, then to me raises the question that has to be asked. Okay. Well, if you're talking about 600 cubic miles of, of water <laughs> in, in these, where did that come from? Yeah. Right. That's see what you've done. There's again, there's no example on earth today where you can look at a lake that occupies nine tenths of its entire catchment basin. Right. But that's what we find. You don't find you what you would find is this yeah. ratio of, of catchment basin area to the actual lake. Typically, it'll be 20 or 30 or 50 to one. So, in other words, you're feeding. You know, you've got a major it, yeah. lake. Look at the Great Lakes uh, are good examples. Yeah, it's, it's catch- the pooling of catch- that, all that water. Yeah. Yes. When you look at Lake Missoula in the, in the catchment basin, I mean, you filled the whole damn catchment basin pretty much up to the, to the threshold. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where did that water come from? Well, it's either going to be meltwater from, from glaciers or it's going to be pluvial. It's going to be, you know, precipitation. Yeah, heavy rain. What else could it be? Rain. Yeah. Okay. If we're if we're not going to go into to, to exotic ideas, it's it's going to be one of those two things or a combination thereof. Right. But here's the problem with both of those is that if it's if it's even if it's snowfall, that snowfall then has to melt to become part of that 600 cubic miles of water. Yeah. Well, then the thing is, is if it's if it's rainfall, that's implying that that carries climatic implications. It sure does. Yeah. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, if you're ponding water 2,100 feet deep to 960 plus PSI, well, you have to make certain assumptions about the stability of the retaining entity, which in this case is a glacial mass. That glacial mass, see, if, if it's a polar glacier, polar glaciers, one of the distinct differences between temperate glaciers and polar glaciers is the stability of the contact between the base of the ice and the substrate or the ground. The ground, yeah. Because typically most dam failures are going to find a way to percolate between the dam and dip and bedrock. Yeah. Right? So in this case, what is happening here is you've got either rainfall, which then implies a, a, a climate warm enough that you've got rainfall. Yeah. And a lot well, now you're looking at a tempered glacier. And if a, temp- a tempered glacier is not frozen to the ground, it's it rides upon a layer of meltwater. Yeah. And it's moving faster, right? Because tempered glaciers tend to do that. That's where you have glacial surges. Mm-hmm. When they do that, they they fissure, they crack, they they form conduits. There, there, there's a in- whole interstitial cavity network, per, you know, all throughout the, the glacier mass. So here's the problem. Then, if it's if it's rain precipitation, that implies a warm enough climate that there's no way you're going to have a stable glacier. Right. If it's meltwater, that's then the glaciers melting and receding back 
Yet the, right. the multiple ice dam model requires that after a failure of the ice dam, the glacier, in this case, the Purcell Trench lobe of the Cordier and Ice Sheet, has to now Reform. extend back, grow back, cross 30 miles of valley. Or, yeah. or to, well, more because it not only has to cross the, the, the mouth of the Clark Fork River, it has to, it has to be 2,100 feet thick plus another 10%. So at the mouth of the river, because glacial ice is, is just a little over 90% the density of water, water, the ice mass has to be another four or 500 feet higher minimum. So the ice dam has to be a half mile thick. But in order for the ice dam to be a half mile thick at the mouth of the Clark Fork River, the, the ice lobe has to be at least 30 miles long because there's a, a, a slope to it. See, So basically... Now you have to have a model where the ice dam is coming, perfectly seals the valley, and now the water starts rising behind it. Well, if that, wa if that water is being, melt is, is being fed by meltwater, that means that the glaciers are melting. melting. If they're uh -huh. melting, they're receding. You see, yeah. this contradiction to me is so glaring. It I is. can't even begin to fathom how, but it's like they kick the can up and it stops at Lake Missoula. Right. So my question for 20 years has been, where is the water of Lake Missoula coming, coming from? from? And where it's coming from is it's the melting of the southern half of the Cordillera and ice sheet, right. the catastrophic melting of that ice sheet. Right. Which must have had a forcing function at some point because that doesn't seem like a... Right, that's what... That's the the whole the whole energy paradox when it comes to the actual the melting of glaciers as we know it. That there had yes. to be something that that you know pro, like we don't have enough energy from terrestrial sources to achieve this in the right. the time frame we're talking about, which then opens up the whole pie to what's the forcing function for this event. Yes, and you just said the key term, the energy paradox. I can see you've been doing your homework. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I like that stuff. That 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 was identified. I mean, they were confronted with that by the early seventies, right? Yeah, and that was really almost in it's still in gradualist models because the assumption was is that you had a uniform melting of the glaciers that took somewhere around eight thousand years, and they still couldn't account for it. And what it amounted to was like a um, roughly, I think, about two hundred and sixty, two hundred and eighty feet, or no more than that. Uh, each year on average. It was like 800 or something, I thought. 800, yeah, it was yeah. 800. Thank you. See, yeah. now, listen. <laughs> that, <laughs> thank thank I, you for that. Well, yeah, yeah, you correct me when I'm wrong. Well, no, you, no, it's <laughs> for your words. I, I just, this recall from some, listening to you talk about this. Well, no, it like, actually is. And, you yeah. know, I could, in fact, I um, wonder if I have that, I might have that slideshow open. I could actually open, and we could look at some of the diagrams sure. that were published in the, yeah, the, the I, early 70s. I think, um, I'd be happy to. Yeah, that'd be that'd be great. Along with all the other evidence for just written into the ground, and then there's all the the peer reviewed stuff that looks at well, let's the microscopic evidence for impact proxies and the all yes. of the all of the rest of it. That just the, the glacier problem alone is is something. Like, as, as if I recall, it's like you couldn't have taken that mass of ice and dropped it on you know in the Pacific warm water, and it still would have taken like tens of thousands of years to, to, to fully melt longer than, than we think it's it's actually taken to melt or that we have evidence that shows yeah. it took to melt. And then yeah. the correlation being that you you then are injecting these giant pulses of, of, of meltwater into the ocean and they're you know correlated to meltwater pulse 1A, 1B, I think 1C as well. And that's that, you know, four, three to 400 feet of sea level rise that happens in what is a, a relatively short period of time. Yeah, I think five to six thousand years right. is the total span from the from the most depressed lowest level to, up that. to modern levels, yeah. um, basically. But within that span of time, it was not a uniform rise. Right. There were times where it was rising continuously and slowly, but they were interrupted by these meltwater pulses. pulses. See, yeah. so what I'm saying is that what we'd have to do is look at the the, the evidence for the. Uh, channel scablands in the Missoula floods as being in effect a record of the entire melting sequence yeah. of what could have been a couple of hundred thousand cubic miles of ice, at least maybe a hundred thousand that would have <laughs> headed onto the into the uh, Columbia watershed. Because I've done a traverse of the Fraser River, which basically is up the, the headwaters of the Fraser is very close to the headwaters of the Columbia. Uh -huh. uh, up in the plateau country of central British Columbia, but the, the Fraser River flows into the Pacific Ocean, whereas 
um, well, the Columbia does too, but the Fraser flows directly and then the Columbia flows south, south and diverts around the basalt plateau and is fed by several others, the main one being the snake. And yeah. so um, the Fraser River discharges up by uh, just north of Vancouver uh -huh. and the Columbia River um, just north of Portland. But the Fraser River is not considered to have contributed to the formation of the scab lands, right? Okay. But if you traverse the, the Fraser River, what you're going to see is all of the same kinds of evidence of catastrophic flows is down that entire run of river, see, right. all the way down to the ocean, from the plateau down to the sea level. You find it all through there, see? So yeah. it's clear that there was catastrophic flows also going through the Fraser, which did not contribute to the, and then uh, to the formation of the Scablands and the Puget Sound uh, actually turns out that they're submerged tunnel valleys. So you right. had the Puget Sound lobe, so where Seattle is. Seattle would have been right there in one of these massive subglacial outbursts right. that occurred at the southern snout of what's called the Puget lobe, see? Yeah. And, but that did not contribute to the formation of the Scablands. Then you cross the uh, Continental Divide over to the east, and then you had these huge floods that came down um, basically in that ice-free corridor area of Alberta, depositing the foothills erratics train and feeding ultimately right. into the Missouri headwaters and leaving right. uh, along the Milk River Valley right uh, at the, the border of, of Alberta and uh, Montana, a huge ripple train, massive right. ripples that are uh, typically – wavelengths on them are up to a thousand feet wow <laughs> yeah and leaving That's behind a big now, pond so, and, and so right now to me the the com most complicated thing is is reconciling what i think is to be a different model of flood inception with the dating that is coming up but i think there are legitimate questions that could be raised about some of the dating um you know particularly using cosmic ray isotopes and things like yeah. that that might might not be giving an accurate dating um, right. because there's conflicting dates. Yeah. You know, for example, there are dates that show that the Cordier and ice sheet was quite late in actually arriving at uh, the 49th parallel and uh, coming into Washington. Well, so there's actually this overlap where there were flood dates, but then the, the Cordier and ice hasn't even reached the border yet. See, right. so where's the water coming from? Where's the water? It comes back to that question. Where's the water coming from? Where's the water coming from? And, you know, you could, the, what I've done is I've made a traverse of the some of the distal reservoirs of the Missoula Basin. The, the most distal reservoir would be the Bitterroot Valley, which reaches um, south into Montana. Uh, God, what's the town? Um, doesn't matter. But at that point is where the water tapers out. It, it was up to 400 feet deep throughout the um, okay. throughout the Bitterroot Valley. And at the very southern end of the valley um, is where the water basically came to an end. Now, this would have been the distal reservoir, meaning that this uh, body of water is quite far removed from the outlet point where the ice dam was, right. which was west of here by several hundred miles, right? In order for that water to drain from the Bitterroot Valley, it has to go through this whole kind of torturous path of, of constrictions and bends and all of this, which is going to slow down, have this enormous breaking effect on the power of that water. And as the water goes down, you see the last, you know, is, it, it, let's just assume the, the, um, the conventional idea here, the water's up to the 4,200 foot level. Mm -hmm. It was about 400 feet deep in the Bitterroot Valley. So then you can figure that the elevation of the floor of the Bitterroot Valley is going to be about 3,800, 36 to 3,800 right in there, right? Yeah. So now, but as the water drains down, the drainage, as the water discharges from the reservoir, it's initially going to be much higher peak discharges. And that, sure. that, that rising limb of the flood is going to rapidly decline so that the final draining of the reservoir is going to be relatively slow fair. Right. So what that means is, is that if you go to the distal reservoir, if you go say into the Clark Fork River Valley near the mouth, the supposed mouth, that water's rushing through there. It's going to be primarily erosive 
right? Because it's mm -hmm. moving through with tremendous pressure and, and velocity. So it's going to be very erosive. It's not going to be creating elegant, layered, laminated Strata, yeah. sediments and all that, right? However, in the distal reservoirs, it's down. where if you have if you've had 90 different lakes, that should show up very clear. There should be clear laminations. Layers, yeah. It, right. It ain't there. <clears throat> what you see is, and I went to, I think, maybe four different gravel pits up the, the axis of the whole valley. Every one of them, the same thing. What you saw was broken and shattered rock. Um, no laminated sediments, you know, fine, silty, or clay-like sediments at all, right? No, no, nothing that you would expect to see in a typical lake bottom where you're going to have mostly low-energy depositional environments. Yeah, which does laminates. Does Yeah, it does, and it laminates it and leave, leaves like those layers of, of periodic flooding that yes. you might be able to see, and you're saying it's not there. You've got evidence of this erosive action, broken up rock, and probably one big layer of... What you would describe it as, it, it appears to be deposited directly from turbulent suspension. Okay. Yeah. That's how you would say it. A sedimentologist looking at it would, would say that. Yeah. A big <clears> event. You know, in other <laughs> words, water's rushing in. The shearing forces are extremely strong. It's mm -hmm. ripping up bedrock. It's breaking that bedrock up. And then it's rapidly draining away. So as rapidly drains away, all of that stuff that's been... Um, tumbled. It's been scoured up and it is being broken up and tumbled through the floodwaters, whoosh, gets dumped. Yep. So there's there's deposition from turbulent suspension, and that's right. the whole Brickin Valley floor. Yeah. Yeah. There and, it is. Yeah. That's actually <clears> – <throat> so on, on those layers, I, I had another question because I, I, did, I saw you talk uh, – show you actually it's a picture from one of your lectures of, of an arroyo. It's in the southwestern United States, and – this was fascinating to me. I didn't, and and it's 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 as if that that entire sort of plain in the southwestern United States was at one point a giant flood plain because of the the layers that seem to be there. I mean, you have your strata layers, and I think that you can you might even see some evidence for the younger driest boundary layer there. But on top, and like the top layer is is this sort of six foot or five to six feet of just one seems to be one single layer, which was deposited in, in what must have been a single event or something like that. It was just yeah, I mean, a tremendous... There, when you see, that, yeah, the arroyos are basically modern gullies yeah. that have formed within the last few centuries. And what they've done is they've, they've incised into the desert floor. Okay. So when you go into one, I mean, the deepest ones I've been in are, you know, 20, maybe 30 feet deep. You know, they, they, they range anywhere from just a few feet to, yeah. to, you know, like I said, 20, possibly the real deep ones might be 30 feet deep. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it gives you a picture of the, the, the structure of the desert floor. And basically, it's all composed of alluvium, quartz alluvium. Now, I haven't seen enough yet or done enough field work to determine whether or not we're looking at one event or multiple events. But okay. either way, it's showing that at periods in the past, there were tremendous amounts of flowing water over landscapes that are now dry desert floors. Sure. And, and clearly implies a, some very major shifts in whatever climate, in yeah. envi obviously in yeah. environment. Um, yeah. And these would be, I guess they'd be difficult to date. Do you think those are connected to that, the melting of the, of the glaciers at the end of the Pleistocene, that those types of floods are just, well, you wouldn't have any, you, go ahead. It, you wouldn't well. You wouldn't have direct meltwater flow from the glaciers. No, not that. Not far there. Down. I yeah. mean, the melt direct meltwater flow of the glaciers on the western side of the continental divide exited would have pretty much all been uh, diverted over to the Pacific Ocean via the Columbia River watershed. Okay, right. cross over to the east side. Uh, you're going to have uh, the Cordilleran ice that's on the east side of the continental divide is going to feed into the Missouri River watershed. Right. And then, okay, then the Laurentide, the primary watershed that captured meltwater from the great Laurentide ice sheet yeah, the big that one. was centered over Hudson Bay, that is the Mississippi, which, of yeah. course, Mississippi and Missouri both took the water to the Gulf. Yeah, and I mean, you Mexico. Can, I've been fascinated to see, so now we've got a lot of like LIDAR imagery and, 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 and uh, good resolution of what it looks like off the coastlines of the continents, right, right out to the continental yeah. shelves and those valleys and those sort of those all of the, the what you can see is the clear erosive tracks from you know they, they run underwater now you can kind of see the paths that all of that that flooding must have tore up it's still it's still written yeah. into the seafloor today 
And, and so some of those first floods, of course, are going to uh, meltwater floods are going to have occurred during the late glacial maximum yep. when sea levels are 350 to 400 feet, feet lower. lower. Yeah. So you're going to have flows out, you know, and leaving deposits that then are subsequently going to be drowned as sea level rises. rises. And they're there. Yeah, those features are found all over. Yeah. The final point about, about you know, the arroyos that you were, that were making is that um, uh, it could not have been formed. I mean, the, 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 allu the, the alluvium, which yep. would be a, a fluvial event, basically, which means flowing water, mm -hmm. would have not been formed directly by meltwater. So then how do you see? Because now you're right. down there, you know, and what I was basically trying to show is that, you, you know, you've got the Rocky Mountains here, and then you've got the meltwaters doing this. Yeah. Right. So the meltwater is of the glaciers is not going hitting south. states like Utah, you know, Colorado. Well, now there were local glaciers over the Rocky Mountains that did melt mm -hmm. all the way down to New Mexico. Yes. But were those glaciers responsible for all of this alluvium that covers thousands of square miles of the desert? Probably contributed to it. But the implication here, I think, is clear that you're talking about prolonged rainstorms right. on a really mega mega scale uh pluvial pluvial meaning um rainstorms being yeah. a pluvial a pluvial period is a period um where it rains a lot okay and i think what we're seeing there is the effects of of extreme pluviation episodic right. extreme where in other words were just rains hellaciously over the deserts for, for days time. on end yeah yeah long and how time. would you do that well <laughs> Uh -huh. um, somehow, again, you need to inject a lot of energy into the system to put that moisture into the atmosphere. atmosphere. Yeah. yeah, that could be, yeah, like you say, cosmic impact into the ocean or, or, or just even into the ice kicking up, kicking up all that, that moisture into the, into the, yeah, the atmosphere. It's, well, right. so the idea of, of impacts into ice is one I began to entertain in the late 80s. Because um, I know I was taking geology courses in the early 90s. Because I wanted to see if am I out way out in left field with this? So I took a couple uh, of years of geology courses, and I found out I wasn't right. But uh, as part of that, I wrote several papers, and one of both of the papers dealt with the the role of impacts in Earth history, which in 1991, 92 was still, you know, um, well, it was gaining momentum. It certainly was because that was around the time when you know what dispelled the the controversy over the Cretaceous tertiary impact mm -hmm. was the final discovery of the crater. Yeah. You know, in the, the, the Chicxulub crater, yeah. yep. which was pretty much confirmed 92, I think about yep. the time I was taking geology courses. So, right, um, but I wrote two papers and particularly one of them I wrote, um, it was about a, with including references and so forth. So it was about 60 pages and basically it was developing the idea that, impacts had played a large role in earth history and had probably been responsible for bringing about the changes that ended the ice age. And this was the first time where I really began to think about in terms of what would happen if you had an impact, you know, because, okay, by that time, there's a lot of papers out, a lot of literature on impacts into the ground, right? Yeah. And there's a growing literature on aerial impacts because of what the we were now learning. You see, once the Soviet Union collapsed, um, a lot of there was a there was an enhanced ex scientific exchange between American scientists and Russian scientists. Right. Uh -huh. Once that happened, we got a lot of new data on the Tunguska right. event in the '90s because of the opening up. Yeah. Right. So I was really keenly like checking that out every time something new would come out. I'm so you start thinking in terms of aerial bursts as well as direct impacts into the ground. But definitely by that time, I was starting to think about what would be the consequences of an impact into the ice sheet. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, the, only, the you're basically looking at two different impact regimes there. And in the early nineties, there's still not much stuff about oceanic impacts. Since then, there's been a considerable amount of research that's come out that is, addressing oceanic impacts, which to me applies directly to an impact on an ice sheet. Right. Um, because basically you're going to instantly sublimate huge amounts of ice yeah, into yeah. meltwater and vapor 
Yeah. Now in an oceanic impact, you're instantly sublimating huge volumes of ocean water into vapor. vapor. And one of the consequences of that would be an extreme rain out event. Yes. Yeah. And it would have to follow that extreme rain outs would, would, you know, would accompany impacts into ice sheets. Yes. Yeah. That seems to be the case. In fact, I've, I've, I spent a bit of time talking with Antonio Zamora and, and guys mm-hmm. like that, it look, the, the, you know, and George Howard looking at the Carolina Bays, which all sort of tracks back to this idea of an impact into the ice. I know Antonio pins it around the, the Saginaw Bay area. They yeah. kind of wrote, you know, based on the, the earth spin and the Coriolis effect of the impact locations and trying to dial it back. But yeah, that's, that's, um, it's a it's a really interesting area, and it's and it's not <clears throat> as if it leaves a crater either. Like they've, they've, there's he's a lot of those theories have now been validated by, you know, good scientific uh, experimentation. Looking at you know when you know shooting projectiles into an ice sheet, the ice sheet essentially does the work of of protecting the ground underneath it. It sort of it does it spreads that shock out, and and you get small chunks, big chunks, all sorts of different mm-hmm. yeah. sized uh, projectiles coming off it. So, you know, there may not be an actual crater there if it's hit the ice, but um, although... Yeah, and it, it depends on the size and velocity, and velocity of the right. incoming object and the thickness of the ice sheet. Exactly, yeah. But if you had a, a mile-thick ice sheet and a half-mile impactor... Well, you're going to get a... Yeah. You're, you're going to get some excavation, yeah, but... for sure. Here's the big but. The water, the ice that's broken up and the water that melts, it's going to, again, it's going to be very much there's going to be parallels with an oceanic impact. Here's what happens in an oceanic impact. The water spreads out. It's forced outwards. And there's a wave opens up. There's a transient crater that forms in the ocean. Now, let's say it's a, it's a two mile ocean and a half mile object. Well, most of the energy of the incoming object is going to be deposited into the ocean water and not gouge a crater if it was a half mile of water and a mile object now you're going to get a crater yeah right but here's the thing when 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 the water uh moves out in a ring it at some point collapses back in and when it collapses back in that's called the resurge wave Mm -hmm. it comes back in and so when it comes back in what it's doing it whatever is is entrained in that water if it's um either you know it's either pure water or let's say that it's it's been a big enough impact that it's actually excavated into the sea bottom well now it's going to be loaded with charged with all of that sediment that was excavated in the crater all of that's going to rush back in and and fill the the crater form and so the original transient crater may be three times as deep as the apparent crater that's filled two thirds of the way full with sediment that's washed back, back in, in. Yes, you right. got that picture. Okay. Similar thing is going to happen in an impact in an ice sheet. However, there's going to be obvious, some obvious differences because in the immediate radius of the impact, it's going to be total sublimation, vaporized, right? As right. you move out and as the temperature drops, you're going to get from vapor to melt water, right? Yep. Now, it's going to be a consider- considerable amount of melt water. The other thing is, is you're going to have mechanical fracturing of the ice sheet itself. And yeah. you're going to, it'll, in effect, it'll be like a whole series of earthquakes that will shake the ice sheet and cause multiple fracturing. So now the water rushes out. Some will rush out over the ice sheet, but water being more dense than the ice can easily now access the bottom of the ice sheet. Okay. Yeah. And that now becomes subglacial, highly pressurized subglacial, subglacial water that's forcing its way under mm-hmm. the ice sheet. And this is where drumlins come in. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, this is where drumlins enter the picture because drumlins are the signature mark of highly pressurized subglacial floods moving over layers of glacial till. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah, underneath the glacier, yeah, it does. Underneath that, the glacier, yeah. The, the signature yeah. of that high pressure water basically pushing its way underneath the glacier and chewing up the yes. ground. Yeah. That's exactly it. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, cuz that And go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's that's I was just going to talk about Burkle Crater, but just I, I don't know if there's uh if there's any more update or any more work being done on that because I found that to be fairly fascinating as well as an example of a uh, an impact into the ocean and you know yes, washing up the waves not, and that has not been verified yet. Right. 
it's still a hypothetical, okay. but it's a, it's a strong contender. Yeah. But until there's more studies done, because the problem is, is that the feature that appears to be a crater form is two miles down. Yeah. That's tough. It's not easy, easy to access to, to determine. Right. However, the Chevron profile is consistent. Yeah. On you know, Madagascar you look the, and yes, Western Australia. In southeastern Africa, along that coastline there, you're going to see evidence of, of major tsunamis, which at, to this point, I have not been able to find if there's been any dating on those. But tsunami deposits thought, are relatively easy to date as long as they've got I within thought, the last 50,000 years and, and have entrained organic material. Yeah, I thought it was like uh, 5,000 BC. I thought I thought it was dated. I thought they'd, they'd looked at some organic material that was like based off the seafloor that's in those chevrons. I'd have to look it up. It could I, be. You know, yeah. you could be right. I, I, I thought that was it was a fairly yeah. young crater, if anything, like something that happened, you know, post-Younger Dryas. Which, um, and it was proposed, and it would seem plausible that, you know, perhaps – if it does turn out that that was an impact into the Indian ocean and it does date around that period of time, that that could have been the, um, the origin of some of the flood myths in the middle East, the Noah story, the Deucalion story, or the Utna Pishtum. Right. Um, it washed up North there up into the, 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 yes. yeah, into the, uh, what is it? The Arabian, um, the yeah, Pers well, Persian it, Gulf it, into that area. Per, into the Persian Gulf. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And uh, deposits right up there, um, basically the headwaters would have been up in Iraq, right near at the um, what the Gordian Gordian Mountains, which yeah. were like the foothills there of, um, yeah, yeah. So That's yeah, the, who was it? Isaac Asimov, I think, that looked at that back in the seventies or eighties and right. said, "Well, if you read the accounts, it looks like you know the ark was swept to the north." Of course, you know, here's the problem. As soon as you bring in Noah's flood, yeah. well, then the skip, skeptics want to jump all over that and think that you're now a biblical, you're a creationist or young, young earth. Yeah. You immediately get tarnished through yeah. association just by mentioning Noah's flood. Indeed, yeah. But I, I, I think you have to look at it and go, no, we don't have to take all the details literally. Right. But all over the Middle East, just like all over the world, but sp specifically... You know, you've got you've got too many stories with too many, you know, parallel stories with 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 overlapping details and stuff, and and it just strikes me that it's hard to say no. There's no historical basis for any of this, yeah. other than just oh, well, it was a it was a uh, you know a local catastrophic flood on the Tigris Euphrates River that left a well. No, no, this clearly from the nature of these stories that have been preserved, we're looking at something that has to be interpreted as exceptional. Yes. And not just yeah. your normal 50 or 100 year flood that, you know, but something on a, on a totally different level. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's almost hard to find exceptions to those sort of, uh, you know, cataclysmic stories of, of ancient civilizations where they had ancestors that, you know, went through some form of world ending event, you know, barely survived and had to start again. I mean, that's, that, that's, you find that almost everywhere. It's a, the, the whole Mahabharata talks about, I mean, they even, that even talks about meteor storms almost directly as if they've witnessed it. You know, you did all yeah. of the Genesis stories, all of the Middle Eastern stories, there's the Native American story. Yeah. It, it's it, the South American stories for that matter. They, they're all, it, it all fits that one, that, that profile of, you know, we were around, we've, we've likely witnessed forms of cataclysm and then the way that we preserve that knowledge is you know it gets mythol myth we deify it we put it in the context of these stories and oral traditions you know people remember the stories and oral traditions and we, we that's how we sort of keep that that data in our you know in our culture um that that it makes a lot more sense to me that it seems yeah it's yeah and and what you're just saying the fact that it that it gets preserved in this particular format and takes on a religious connotation is not in the least bit surprising no <laughs> we it, going back to the Tunguska event I mean we can see right there that in the, the people who survived that it spawned a whole new religion yeah it was. amongst them that you know made them believe that this you know part of their religious belief was that this epicenter of the of the explosion was a cursed place and, and in fact, uh, one of the early guides that led one of the Russian scientists in, 
and it might have been uh, Leonid Kulik when he went in there. I've forgotten mm-hmm. who exactly it was, but um, when he came back, uh, basically his fellow tribesmen killed him. <laughs> Jeez. Said, you, you just breached the, you know, yeah. you, you've transgressed the ordinances here of our religion. You know, Agdi, the fire god, came down, and this is now cursed. Yeah. And you just took somebody in, I, you know. So, yeah, it was yeah. pretty extreme. And, and, and basically, that's a Tunguska single event. Imagine you have an event where you've got basically several hundred Tunguskas. And this is, this is a model yeah. that now is not really unrealistic. No, yeah, it, it, it's, if anything, it seems like we're discovering that these things happen more and more frequently than we ever thought they did. You know, it used yes. to think that they were, you know, millions of years apart, but turns out they happen far more frequently. And they may not be the only form of cosmic threat to the planet. I think that's the, you know, that's, you know, I, st- I st- started looking at this in the terms of ancient civilizations, just this whole, my whole last five or six years where I've just been trying to do this sort of thing full time. It's, you know, I started looking at ancient civilizations and it's kind of inevitable to then swivel around to catastrophism and 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 the and where that sort of, where these things come from, what may have happened to ancient civilizations, and I guess the importance of trying to understand just how it threat the planet is and 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 look into that. I mean, I'm just the stuff I mean, the, the new area that I'm looking at, I'd love to hear hear what you have to I know you've been looking at this as well is is uh is really the, the the threat that is represented by the sun and 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 uh, solar yeah. events and also other concepts like this you know some form of coherent magnetism on a galaxy level that that may be affecting us on these huge cycles that you know we we're seeing all sorts of activity on the other planets at the moment um, and you know the magnetic poles shifting uh, further and further every year at this point we may be headed for some form of pole shift event. Uh, I'd love to, yeah. I mean, I, I think these things have also played a role in the past, um, and they're just things we're barely scratching the surface of in terms of understanding now. I mean, what is it, the last 25 years now, we've we've finally got some instruments looking at the sun, and we're learning more about yeah. it. Well, we, 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 let's come, we'll come back to the sun in a minute. Yeah, but sure. It, what I'm thinking here as you're talking this is, is you know, we, we started this conversation in terms of catastrophism and how it was present at the beginning, and then it, fell into disfavor so that as we're coming into the 20th century, right. catastrophism is pretty much a dead deal. And this is why Brett's work in the 20s and 30s was was so controversial because yeah. this was the first major really solid uh, challenge to a strict gradualism of the 20th century. Yep. With the 1980s, what we see is this acceptance of catastrophism in Earth history, right? And so that by the time we get to the turning of the millennium, right? By the year 2000, catastrophism is now pretty much an accepted paradigm okay. in earth history, but not necessarily in human history. No, no, not the, yet. This is wow. now, I would say, is the next evolutionary development in catastrophism. Yeah. is recognizing its role in our human story on earth. And, and right. that leads us directly into the the issue of why, for example, we don't find that hard evidence for ancient advanced technological civilizations that the critics are so insistent upon Dismissing. requiring, oh, yeah. you see. Yeah. But what they don't understand, and this has become clear to me, talking to them, reading their stuff, seeing, uh, seeing them uh, you know, on various uh, venues, is that they don't understand the scale of these global events right they don't understand how extreme the younger dryas event and 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 yeah. associated foreshocks and aftershocks really were yeah they yeah. don't understand that they and so when you have a, a flood sweeping over uh, uh you know filling virtually every watershed on a continent any any village any town any city gone that's built in in a river you know you can pick pick a river pick a major river in in north america i defy you to find a major river in north america that has not had massive catastrophic floods of one type or another yeah you know and, and i can start pulling them up you know dozens of them. go to the ohio river yeah here's the studies they're going back to the literally to the 1920s where they were finding evidence 
that the Ohio River had once flowed during the deglacial up to 250 feet d- above the modern floodplain, <laughs> right? Yeah. You go to the Missouri, same thing. The Mississippi, yeah, huge volumes of water. But go to <laughs> any other river in North America, and you're going to find the same thing. Now, you look at where did the first major cities evolve uh, on um, in in the modern rise of civilization? Like Middle East. Middle East, but specifically in terms of the, the, the local geography, they were at mouths of rivers and on coastlines. Right. And the major, a lot of the major cities rose because they were trading centers, right? Now, you had some, of course, that were not, but most of them were along either if they weren't on the coastline, they were in a river valley. Yes. Right? Yeah. Now, as well. if you had ice age civilizations, and I'm not here now, I don't want anybody listening to immediately think I'm talking about, you know, um, you know, any crystal technologies sure. or lasers or airplane or any of that, right? right? Because we have to keep in mind that a technological civilization may evolve that could look completely different yeah. than, the, than the one we are participating in. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think we have an electromechanical approach to problem solvings and, and the way we look at everything is framed by our technology and we don't know everything yet. There is much that exists outside our sphere of understanding yes. and we'll know more yes. in the next hundred years, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And in fact, I think that I, I think a strong circumstantial case could be made that there were civizations that were utilizing Forms of Use lighting energies or methodologies yeah. that we may suspect exist and yeah. may have actually been confirmed, you yeah. know, unknowingly by people like Tesla and Wilhelm Reich and, uh, and, and others. Yeah, um, the whole Zenic surface wave uh, phenomenon. If you've looked into the, the vis of technologies and the Zenic surface wave as a new. Uh, a new method of electromagnetic wave propagation. It's going to fundamentally shift how we think about things like electricity and power distribution using basically the the interface between the air and the land. I mean, they're, they're already in, they already have a wave running on the planet. They've got a global test site in Texas where they build a tower. They can plug a receiver in anywhere in the world and receive power and signal. There's, this is... It's based on, you know, another theory of electromagnetic wave propagation. I use it as an example to talk about perspective of technology, you know, when people, you know, you, and then you just look at the, the, we couldn't have imagined this 10 or 15 years ago. I mean, obviously Tesla, uh, it's, it's based on what Tesla was doing, but I mean, it's a fundamental game shifter in just how we look at it. And I think there's plenty more of those things that exist outside of our perspective that may have been utilized in the past. And there's a lot of stuff from the past to me that doesn't make a lot of sense. If you, the deeper you dig into things like the boxes in the Serapium uh, underground, you know, and the Giza Plateau and all those sort of things, I think there's, there's a lot more going on there than, than you know, oh, absolutely. tombs and, and bull boxes. You know, as a builder, I've, you know, yeah. I'm a bit familiar with I bet. moving <laughs> weights and, and uh, you know, I, and, 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 and here's the thing, I, I mean, you know, we, we want to move a, a 50 ton load. Now we bring in a crane, yes. right? We don't bring in, you know, a hundred guys, 200 people to, to move it. We use a crane. Now to me, the, 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 um, the contradiction is so glaring. It just like boggles my mind. It wouldn't, yeah. doesn't this raise questions when we look at the, some of the infrastructure yeah. of what we presume were hunter gatherer or nomadic, um, you know, or, or, or subsistence farmers who for some reason decide that they're going to start quarrying 10 and 20 and 50 ton stones and even up, move them vast distances, set them up um, yeah. in the landscape. Uh, and, and they're going to do this all over the world. They're, they're going to do it in South America. They're going to do it in, in, in Africa. They're going to do it, you know, in, in the Middle East. They're right. going to, you know, in North America, they're building these gigantic earthwork structures, right. uh, you know, that, you know, when you, uh, I would like to get some of these academics out and just have them dig a six foot hole. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, I, look, look, I, I want you to just comprehend here. Go look at Cahokia. Look at the <laughs> monks mound at Cahokia. What the hell? Okay. Maybe it was excavating with, with wicker baskets and deer antlers. Okay. Let's accept that. Okay. But what the hell is the motive? Right. How are you going to get? And okay, if you had one case of it, you could say, well, yeah, you had this, this egotistical 
guy, this pharaoh, this chieftain, it's whatever. Cracking the whip. Yeah, and he wants yeah. to build this monument to his ego. Okay. But all over the world, oh, yeah, it in doesn't make example, sense. in case after case after case, these outsized projects that don't seem to have any ostensible motive other than, well, it was it was part of their religious well, it's, or it's, ceremonial. It's, it's always that doesn't explain anything. No, that I, doesn't explain anything. Yeah, but I think, and and this wouldn't be something we get into tonight, but in a future conversation, That'd or I'd, you know, we'll probably be addressing this at some point in the Cosmographia podcast. But um, that really, my take on this would be that we're basically looking at the the, the remains, the the refuse of an ancient technological system. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I think a lot of this stuff's been inherited. And again, we, we don't have to dive down this hole necessarily either, but it's always, to me, the, the fascinating aspect is it's the biggest stuff, the most advanced stuff. It's at the bottom layers. It's at the the oldest layers mm -hmm. of a lot yeah. of these civilizations. And, you know, the, I, I you know a lot of, I've been attacked by some anthropologists and archaeologists for some of this stuff too. And and I focus heavily on the, on the evidence for advanced technology. I've done a big multi-part series on the Serapium, um, I just think that the other element of some of these things is is precision. Like that, when you get right into it, and the people we should be listening to as experts on this stuff are guys like you, architects, construction, you know, experts, engineers, and when, you almost without exception, when those types of people look at some things, like the boxes mm -hmm. in the Serapium, like the precision in the Great Pyramid, things like that, it's just that they're astounded. It's you know, it, it's just it's in a lot of cases you're looking at stuff that is beyond the capability of the ancient civilizations as we know them and certainly beyond the capability of the tools that are in the archaeological record and given the extension of the human timeline genetically now we're at least 300,000 years old the oldest human remains they found are in Morocco given the 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 prevalence of catastrophism and the younger Dryas this none of this is out of you know given the fact that give human beings you know warm weather and calm weather at least then then we start solving problems it's it's entirely possible that we're looking at things that have been inherited, reclaimed, and and absorbed into different cultures and civilizations. You know, after this yeah. this this arose. So yeah, that's a so it's a whole other barrel of fish, I guess. But that's well, there are too many anomalies within yeah. the conventional explanation right. of prehistory. There's just ju there's just too many. Yeah, there's too many things unaccounted for that are glossed over that are not explained and that just don't fit right. into this model yeah. of, you know, the rise from basically millennia after millennia of barbarism up into, you know, civilization between four and 5,000 years ago. Yeah. No, it, it, it's just, and I, I got to see it. And, and for my, where I'd look at it is it really, we're looking at modern history and this, this this could be, to me, a valid way of looking at it. We're looking at modern history as basically a rebooting of history. Yes, I think so too. After the after the system crash during the Younger Dryas, that's what it was. Because and it pretty much wiped out most of the hard drive. Definitely, and there were little bits and pieces <laughs> left. So yeah. you know that's where we're at now. I think you're right, and and as you said before, like the culture, like that's the next wave of 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 catastrophism in the mainstream is the acceptance of the cultural implications of this yes, yes. in fields like anthropology and archaeology, because that's, you know, I, I talked with George Howard recently and, you know, we just, there's been some real resistance to, to hit the, even just the idea of all of the scientific literature behind the younger Dryas. There's the Wikipedia page has been manipulated. I mean, I showed yep. this in one of my podcasts to just to talk about, they try to tie it back to, to Plato, to Donnelly, to, to esoteric fringe concepts without ever addressing the weight of scientific evidence that's now behind this because it it upsets that apple cart so badly I think that it's it's kind of seen as a threat it's a weird it's a weird thing to me like and we don't have in the same way that the younger Dryas and all that science is kind of a threat to the modern narrative around climate change we don't see it being addressed by the modern you know science communicators like Neil deGrasse Tyson etc they're not talking about this I think because it's it's such it's it's going to represent such a fundamental shift in most of what we know. We kind of have to rebuild. Yeah, I think a lot of our knowledge base based on it. But you know, I think it's coming. I think it's undeniable. Well, see, you you brought a, you brought something up, which clearly I think you know points to the political ramifications, sure. which is that, um, you know, basically what what we're now being presented with is a scenario in which all global change is being driven by human activity. 
and that this global change is going to lead to a catastrophe. There's going to be a mass extinction that's going to be equivalent to the five great in Earth's history, yeah. proclaimed by, by people who clearly have no concept yeah. whatsoever yeah. of what we're talking about when we're talking about those five major mass extinctions, right? right. I'm actually writing an essay now that's going to about that where it's going to pretty much, I'm going to put it out there very soon. Right. And it's going to be, look, this is, this is what we now know about the, the late uh, Ordovician or the late Devonian or the, 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 um, the uh, Triassic Jurassic or the Permian Triassic when 95% of all species on earth yeah. went extinct. Do you have any idea what that means? You know, if nine tenths of every living thing in the ocean, every species yeah, that's, goes extinct, what does that mean? You know, what does it mean when you, uh, yeah. So, so here's the thing. Here's what, the thing that we're faced with. Now. At the same time, we're realizing that we live on an extremely dynamic planet that has oscillated back and forth between full glacial and full interglacial ages repeatedly over and over mm -hmm. that the climate is this constantly changing dynamic thing on the earth, right? Yep. That, that our modern few centuries have, has been blessedly stable oh, it's when amazing. looked at within the larger framework, but we are being told that we are now in the driver's seat all of these other factors that we're now becoming aware of, we can just ignore those because we humans, through our actions, are now going to cause a climate emergency, a climate crisis. <laughs> an extinction right? event. An extinction event. And if we don't now bring human activity under complete control yeah. and begin to control every detail of human life on this planet, we're going to destroy the planet. Yeah. So there's this tremendous political ramification to these ideas, you see, yeah. because now we're here, we are saying, look, there are civilizations in the past that got wiped out by natural catastrophes. Look, there have been mass extinctions that have occurred over and over and over again by caused by natural catastrophes, that humans have been as much a victim of those natural catastrophes as the species that went extinct almost. Yeah. Look, there have been constantly changing climate and environments throughout Earth history on any scale we choose to look at it. Now, here yeah. we come saying that kind of stuff, and look, civilizations in the past have succumbed. Well, that does not fit, see? Not the political so, narrative, right? And, and, and here's something. Maybe about a year ago, a Wikipedia page showed up on me, and it was actually fairly <laughs> laudable. It described me, I thought, in very fair terms, said I was a, uh, a theorist and a proponent of the Younger Dryas impact and stuff like that. Well, maybe a month or two ago, yeah, you don't Somebody have a degree. Pointed out to me that it had been changed. Yeah. So the the the, the fair-minded laudable was replaced with one that basically said, "Oh, he has no credentials and he's never been peer-reviewed." Right. Which is right. Nonsense. And, and I would say, well, okay. First of all, you know, I don't know what your credentials necessarily mean because I know dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of people out there with so-called credentials that are basically just bullshitters. Okay, peer reviewed. The peer reviewed process has been totally compromised, right? Yeah, it, it has. Totally compromised. But what I would say to that person that, that posted that is that I tell you what, <clears throat> okay, I've never had a paper peer reviewed, but I know a hell of a lot more about what's in the peer reviewed literature than you do. Yeah. And I'll bet money on that. You want to come and see my archives? I've got 20,000 scientific papers here. Yeah. I know what's in the fucking peer reviewed yeah. literature. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The other thing I have is I have a lot of facts. Yeah. You know, whatever your credentials are. Okay. You can have your credentials, but I've got some facts and you want to go toe to toe and see who's got the most credible facts. Let's go for it. Yeah. Right. Well, this, of course, this anonymous person who replaced, right. Then somebody posted, uh, I saw a lady posting three or four days ago that, um, uh, well, I went, I, Googled Randall Carlson and went into Wikipedia Ugh, and Wikipedia. there was nothing there anymore. So somebody went in and took it down. Yeah. First of all, somebody replaces the, 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 the one that said, you know, I was a theorist on the younger driest impact and other things that were, you know, I thought pretty fair minded and fairly accurate replaced with this basically personal attack. And now apparently there's nothing. So yeah. see right there already, I've reached the status in my 
proponent of these ideas that it's become a threat. Right. It's become a threat to these political factions that basically now want to create this scenario that we're now the bad guys. But yeah. you see, here's the thing. They want to they want to make carbon dioxide the demon. <laughs> Such right. a silly idea in the first place. It is a silly, yes, oh, to it's... quote um Monty Python, that's a silly idea. It's a very silly idea. <laughs> it's a very silly idea. Yeah, we like more CO2. It's good for the planet. It's greening the planet. It is. It's, it is good for and, but but see if you say that, Ben, well, no, now you're a climate change denier. Right, and you're 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 pro pollution too, which is the thing that yeah, always oh, yeah, gets me yeah. about this. The first thing you have to do is distance yourself from doesn't mean we're supporting we should clean up pollution. That's a bad pollution's bad. But yes, this the CO two being demonized thing is one of the just the silliest thing. I, you know, I, I look back at when the planet supported the biggest, the mega, like the biggest life, the mega flora, mega fauna, the dinosaurs. CO two rates mm. have been so much higher. I know you talk about it as well. It's like greenhouses; they pump it into to to aid plant growth. There was the, I think the period in the the little ice age or whenever when CO two dropped down to what two hundred odd, nearly plant life nearly stopped on the, the great planet. ice age. The great ice age. I mean, yeah, during the yeah during the late glacial maximum, it might have gotten as low as one hundred and eighty parts per million. Yeah, which and I tell you what, at that at that point, it's it's hovering on the threshold of absolute disaster. It really is. Yeah, plant life stops. Everything stops. It's. You know, it's a it's a trace gas in the atmosphere that's been demonized, and I I'd like to think there's a little bit of hope in that. I think there's you know this is new kind of information to me, but there's it seems like there's a sl a slight like a quiet revolution happening in some of the academic institutions against this political narrative around it because what is going to be interesting is the when the IPCC report in 2022 comes out, they've now opened it up to include not just the sun the sun. Yeah, yeah. there's not just not just light though, the solar cosmic particles and particles from the sun and the mm -hmm. forcing effects of the sun, and that's like letting that's like letting a, a you know a, a teenager play on the playground with this little CO two toddler. You sure you want to let yeah. this guy play in here because he's going to have a, a bigger impact than this little kid over here? You know this CO two thing. It's I think I'd it, like to see, think there'll be some reality yeah. coming to it at some point. You would certainly hope so, and yeah. and, and of course to exclude the sun and volcanism. It should have been part of the equation right from the outset. Yeah, it's why the computer 30 models, years ago. the models have been bogus forever. I mean, yes. yeah, it's silly. So maybe that is, I hope that's a ray of hope. Yeah. I hope it's hope. But, you know, the sun, clearly the sun has had a bigger <laughs> role to play. Definitely. And the thing that I'm looking at, and I don't want to talk about it too much yet, because okay. there's still a lot to learn about it. And, you know, as I go along, I find new, new threads of, of research and information that I like to follow and I like to digest before I start talking about it. But the thing that is really exciting me now is this, the idea of the sun grazing comets and nah. the role that the infall of these huge numbers of sun grazing comets may be having on the, um, on the stability of, of the sun. Right. That, because there already seems to be uh, evidence suggesting a connection between the infall of, of sun grazing comets um, coronal mass ejections, solar storms, and so on. Uh, high, high, heightened activity in the chromosphere, which is then related to the CMEs. Yep. And our knowledge of the sun grazing comets is relatively new. I mean, it's only since we've had the, 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 the sun gazing telescopes and satellites in yeah. place over the last couple of decades. But yeah, what you were talking about earlier, the idea that there's this, we have to begin looking at the big picture because mm -hmm. the influx of objects such as comets to the inner solar system is probably being modulated on the galactic level yeah yeah it's so seen. we have to we have to in order to understand the which implies this that in order to understand the terrestrial ecology we have to begin to thinking start thinking on the galactic level that's what that implies yeah I think so too. It's it's just, and that's a very new area. Right? It's just like they're just still developing yes. models for it. They, they, they seem to think that there are some, much as the sun has this, these currents that it sort of washes around. The the galaxy may also have them as well, and maybe yeah. that has something to do with polarity. And if as we move through it, that may be what triggers the Earth's polarity shifts. It may trigger solar activity. Yes, you know, I, yes, I, I, exactly. I, and that may be more devastating than we've ever thought it could have been. I mean, Robert Schock's work's really interesting. I've personally looked at things like vitrification all over the world. It's 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 tremendously mysterious. Not, not We yeah. don't really know yeah, how this is. stuff forms, but it could be as a result of the sun. I mean, 
there's ancient ancient accounts of the, of basically the sun stopping in the sky it could affect earth's rotation there's a lot there's a, there's a lot there that that seems to you know that, that we need to that yeah that's begging into. for an explanation yeah yeah and there's been a bit of a controversy between you know robert shock i guess it's kind of settled around robert shock and graham hancock yeah graham is a is you know an unabashed proponent of the uh, younger driest impact cosmic impact and and robert has basically rejected that although i think i've gotten a few indications that he's may maybe more open because for one thing i tried the last interaction i had with robert was at uh at a conference in little rock about a little over a year ago and mm -hmm. This is where I've tried to present the idea that, you know, we may be looking at, you know, when we start talking about the Younger Dryas, it's more complicated than a single event. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean. And we may be, with this now, this connection between um, enhanced cometary flux in the inner solar system possibly being linked with variability in the sun's activity, we may be looking at a way now to integrate. It right. may not be an either-or proposition. It might be that in the case of a major cometary storm, there is, you know, a consequence, a major solar consequence, whether it's directly from the infall of comets or the forces that are driving those comets are also affecting the sun, as you were suggesting. Yeah. And I, I look, cause I mean, it seems to me that's, that's always been, I mean, I, I, I think the weight of the science right now supports the younger driest cosmic impact. You have things like extraterrestrial platinum and iridium and these direct yes. kind of direct impact proxies. We may have a crater with the Hiawatha crater. Hopefully, George Howard tells me they're working on validating and, and dating that more accurately. I know it's it's within the window, but it, it may be older, may not be. But when you look at just the Greenland ice core uh, temperature details, you know, it, the, the ups and downs don't just happen in the, the Younger Dryas, all right? You've got the bowling right. aneroid before that. There's been significant upheaval to the yes. system that may yes. have been triggered. You know, I, I think we could be looking at a period where there's been multiple types of cataclysms that have hit the planet. And, yeah, I, 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 I'm interested in their work, but I, I, I don't I – ne I never quite understood why Shock kind of found it such – and I think this was Graham's position as well, which if I can, can sort of paraphrase it, was that, you know, it, it's – it doesn't necessarily need to be an either or thing. Like it's not like we're ruling out the cosmic impact thing. Those things happen. Looks like mm -hmm. it definitely is what happened in the younger Dryas, but there's certainly plenty of room for, you know, we know that the sun can can kick up and cause all sorts of things. And that's just that's we're just beginning to learn more about that as there are there is evidence for it and things like the Carrington event and whatnot. Yeah. But yeah. Now the Carrington event is not gonna leave a geological signal. No, that's like a minor little Peep. It's right. not, not like a, yeah. However, I mean, Still. it could have a major cultural effect oh. that could leave a historical signature and sure something would. perhaps maybe a little bit stronger. I mean, because it, it, it's very plausible that we might be looking, say, at something like uh, a, a Carrington order event uh, magnified by an order of magnitude. Yeah. Yeah. If that happened, you know, yeah, we're, we're in deep trouble. We're, we're, we're a decade or two climbing out of that hole. We are. I had a small yeah. taste of that earlier this year because I was in the area of Northern California that went through all of the power shutoffs when we had like a month or so of no power on and off. You know, that was luckily that oh. had, that had small edges to it. You know, I could drive twenty minutes and get to get to the edge of it. But within that zone, I mean, people still were already starting to act really wacky. I've I've often thought you you don't need you don't need some sort of crazy new virus to to trigger the zombie apocalypse just turn off the power and, and the internet to people and, and give it a week then you'll have the zombie apocalypse right there yeah i think uh yeah if, exactly if, if we get a solar flare that you know melts all the copper wiring on the planet yeah that's definitely going to have a, a cultural impact um, that would suck that would so this is my concern with you know the obsession over carbon dioxide is because we're, 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 I think we're misfocusing our attention here on, on the yes. things that we really need to be looking at. Yeah. I you agree. Not, not, and Hey, I'm, I, I'm not against learning more about carbon dioxide and the carbon cycle and its role. But I think that at this point, you know, we're seeing tainted science and yeah. it's, it's got a political agenda behind it. Yes. And a lot of people are falling for it and it, you know, yeah. when you think about now, the de is there a single Democratic candidate that is not <laughs> totally on board with this nonsense? Yeah, and, and it's it's going to impact, you know, the 
all sorts of aspects of life if those policies you know get through based on them and it's as you say it's there's there's plenty to learn about it i mean i the best analogy this is one george howard told me he said it's like it's like the whole discussion we're having about climate change now and co2 it's it's like we're, we're arguing about what what's what radio station that we're listening to in the car. We're sitting in the car and I want the radio station on this channel and you want it on that channel. We're arguing about it. Meanwhile, the car's sitting on the railway tracks. And, yeah. and eventually yeah. we're going to feel pretty silly about arguing about the radio yeah. station when we look up and see the trains coming. Like that's yeah. – that's, Yeah, that's a good analogy, Ben. Yeah, George Howard, all credit to him. He's, uh, oh, that was George? Yeah, that was George. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Funny guy. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I I agree. I think that's the, and I'd like to think that it seems like there is a quiet, you know, this in some of the papers that are coming out now, and and as they're now going to open it up to the sun and and change the models, I'd like to think maybe that'll, it's going to take a couple of years, but maybe that'll we'll be able to dial back some of the, um, some of the fuss about it because if you just look back at the historical record, I mean, you you can tell that I mean our civilization has risen to where it is on the back of nice calm weather. It's what we've had, and mm-hmm. it's 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 something that we we kind of enjoy to this day, and yeah, we climate we, we haven't really experienced what real climate change is in well, our modern yeah, world. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> and, and and that's the irony of this situation is that yes, uh, there is such a thing. Climate crises are real. Yeah. However, whatever the causal mechanism of those, whatever the triggers of those climate emergencies, has not been carbon dioxide. Right. And what we're doing is we're singling out carbon dioxide as what's now going to drive the future climate crisis. We're ignoring the sun. We're ignoring volcanism. But yeah. like you said, that's great that the IPC, IPCC is going to now begin in, incorporating it. We'll have to see. Yeah, we will um, have to see. We have to see how, how that works out. Because, I mean, when you be, start looking at the, the solar literature, I mean, it's overwhelming. The, yeah. the sun's imprint in in global change is undeniable indeed yeah <clears throat> yeah and one of the things we is we're also heading into a, a solar minimum period and it's likely that we're going to see a little bit opposite of the trend i mean that's why they kind of changed it from global warming to to climate change well, yeah. right? because the trend line kind of st- stopped well There's it went from global of- warming which actually is a very precise testable hypothesis it is yeah. right to climate change which could be anything yeah. And is anything. Yeah, it's always. It's changing. anything now that's, you know, but it's gone from climate change, which doesn't sound um, extreme enough. So it's become now the climate emergency, emergency. or climate yeah. crisis. Yeah. And that's the term now that's being used, the climate crisis. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, it, and it's, <clears throat> as you say, if, <clears throat> if it fits the pattern, then then weather becomes climate uh, right, it's yeah. always everything that happens. It's just weather that is the normal variability of, of weather ups and downs. That that now becomes climate. You know, the extreme cold is caused by the extreme heat. All that sort of stuff. It, it's yeah. It's I just wish they could take the politics out of it and we could stick to the science. And then, but at this point, as you say, we're kind of getting some junk science in it. I big fan of Tony Heller's YouTube channel. I think he's doing a great job exposing a lot of that. Um, okay, I'm not familiar with Tony Heller. Tony I'm Heller. Thinking. Good YouTube channel. I mean, he just he looks he just looks at the data. He looks at NASA and NOAA data and shows you kind of how it's been. It's funny because because you, you every other country in the world, all of the, the the models and the data, it's not showing the trends that come out of a lot of the American research. And it's basically because we've been jiggering with the data from the nineteen like the nineteen thirties gets excluded. Now that's been all the, the you know the actual absolute values have been lowered so that they're they're no longer the hottest decade in the nineteen thirties. It's he he does a good job of, uh, I, of using you know their I data against back. them. I, I do, I've listened to some of his his videos now. Yeah, yeah I do know who he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, I I was very impressed. And he, by his take on it, he, of course, being savagely attacked by uh, all the political agenda people, he's you know of gets course. censored and all that sort of thing, which is just yeah, no good at all. So it's uh, we've got we're nearly coming up on two hours, Randall. I've got um, one little que- one more question for you, I guess, and uh, sure. It has to do with um, the the effects of cosmic impact. Something that I've personally found really fascinating, listening to some of your old lectures, is 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 what is the uh, the impact and and the one of the effects that seems to have happened that may be related to these impacts, as I understand it from what you've said, is these things of these these just great and these massive fires that have happened in the past. So the Chicago fire, 
the Miramichi fire, things like that. Can you can you explain the kind of the mechanism of what's happening there? Because those those were these tremendous events where you know just it's like the whole the whole horizon gets on fire and you just get this tremendous like burn ratio that 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 you know would take weeks and weeks in a normal catastrophic fire today, and it just happens in a day. Uh, I mean, the the accounts that came out of the Chicago fire are terrifying um but you i think what you were you were getting at is is that they're somehow related to the to potentially cosmic activity i'm interested in 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 that um aspect yeah well i understandably so um <laughs> uh yeah and of course this is purely speculative at this point yet sure. it, it's it, it you know uh it's either a very bizarre coincidence right. or there is something something behind it because we can look at the um you mentioned the chicago fire which is the um most deadly most devastating urban fire in american history yes right which happened um it's, it's generally if you read the eyewitness accounts and the studies of it 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 broke out on uh october 8 1871 mm -hmm. in the evening it was a sunday and it was that evening between eight and nine o'clock when the fire is first burst out of presumably Mrs. O'Leary's barn right. and then within an hour pretty much swept over all of Chicago. Um, that was the most devastating urban fire in yeah. American history. The most devastating forest fire was the Peshtigo, Wisconsin Peshtigo. fire. Peshtigo, which um, basically burned up um, a huge swath of land up both sides of uh, the uh, uh, the peninsula okay. there uh, yeah. on uh, on eastern Lake Michigan, um, uh, Green Bay, okay. where, the, where Green Bay comes in, right up both those sides. There was a, a firestorm that swept north. Um, it killed somewhere between fifteen hundred and twenty five hundred people. They're not sure of how many because the firestorm came on so fast um, and it burned up within a matter of a few hours, burned up huge swaths of, of old growth pine forests. And uh, what's interesting about that is if you read the accounts and the studies of it show that it essentially uh, ignited at a, between eight and nine o'clock on Sunday evening, October 8th, 1871. So, You've got this coincidence there of the most devastating urban fire, most deadly devastating urban fire, and the most deadly devastating forest fire happening simultaneously. Sudden eruptions of fire crossing Lake Michigan to I, Manisti. I think that's how you say it. I've been corrected on this. Um, I like to pronounce, get my word pronunciation right, but Manisti, I think, is how it's pronounced. But um, there was also a huge fire that broke out there, a, a firestorm. Now, it doesn't get the press as Peshtigo did because there was probably only a few hundred people that were killed there because it was nothing but a few lumbering camps. It was not a village. But right. you had this triangle of these oh, okay. three massive firestorms that all broke out simultaneous, almost as if they were all set off simultaneously by a remote ignition switch. Right. And they were extraordinarily hot, extraordinarily devastating. And uh, there were several other lesser well-known fires that also happened that night as well. One, I huh. know there was one in Minnesota, one in Iowa. I forget. So there was like the, the Midwest that Sunday evening was ignited in probably five or six of these tremendous firestorms that all started yeah. at the same time, hmm. almost simultaneously. Now, it was old Ignatius Donnelly who first... Hmm looked at that because this happened back in his day, you yeah. know, um, he was around in 1871 when this happened and he was the one, of course, he's famous for having written a couple of books on Atlantis. Atlantis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But in, I believe it was in an appendix to the, uh, Ragnarok, the age of fire and gravel, where he looked at that and proposed that, um, it might've been caused by, a comet breaking up and disintegrating in the atmosphere, which is way ahead of his time. An idea that was completely ignored for the most part. Um, but I don't think that he was ever aware of the fact that one of the great meteor storms uh, that Earth encounters every year peaks on October 8th and yeah. October 9th. The Draconids. Oh, Draconids. Um, the Draconids, yes. Yeah. And as far as I know, I'm the first one to make that connection. 
Okay. Um, cool. Early, some other theorists looking at uh, believe that it might have been the breakup <laughs> of comet. Uh, God, now this is you know fifteen twenty years ago that I'm having to dredge some. Yeah, of this sorry, up, I but, put you on the spot with this question. <laughs> No, it's a great question. I don't yeah. mind getting into it at all. But that's the, the essence of it. But then okay. that's not an isolated example. You mentioned the Miramichi, Miramichi. fire, which was... Um, same time you know, of year. year. What? It was the same time, same time of year. Same time of year. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it, it peaked on October 9th, if right. I remember it. You know, you typically, I've got a whole presentation that I put together about this with, with awesome graphics and stuff. And at some point, I'm going to be putting that out. I put bits and pieces of it out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there was the Hinkley fire, um, which was 1882, I believe, 1883, right in there. Very same, similar situation where you had just this sudden firestorm. Now, bear in mind, I've, I, I've had people criticize and say, well, it was well known that there was a drought then over the Midwest. And I said, well, well yes, of course. I mean, because the things that you, you have to have multiple uh, factors yeah. converging in order to get something like that. And one of them is, yeah, you have to have, have a, a fuel load that's going to be the result of, of, of drought conditions. Yeah. I'm not saying that the drought wasn't an important part of the thing because it was, but there might be, but just saying there's a drought, for example, doesn't explain five or six simultaneous outbursts of floods other than just Five. that's a bizarre coincidence. Right. And there, there's more to it. I mean, it, it's the, the extraordinary ferocity and, and heat of these fires, which was unprecedented. The colors, um, right? It was, there was reports of different colors and the, and the quieting of the atmosphere before it happened, like the calm before yes. the storm kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it seemed like a lot of just odd, yeah, the, as you say, this unusual ferocity and, and, and all these other aspects that were related to it that made them so much more savage and kind of unique than, than most other fire events like this. <clears throat> Right. Well, the, the Finkley, Finkley, the Hinkley firestorm, which is one that I learned about actually as a little kid because I grew up just north of Minneapolis. Hinkley is in Minnesota, and it's on the route from uh, Minneapolis to Duluth. So we would regularly drive to Duluth um, for, you know, it was a place that you, you went back in the 50s. You know, you would go there to, um, you know, it was just cool to go up on the North Shore and all of this because that's an amazing place actually yeah which we could do a discussion on at some point in the future i'd love to because yeah i'd love some wild stuff going on there but anyways we would go through hinkley and then both my dad would like to tell the story and my grandmother would like to tell the story about the hinkley fire because it's it's embedded into those people's memory you know because everybody has that lives there has a great grandfather ancestor somebody particularly back in the 50s you know they're probably all gone now, but then there was still a lot of people alive whose grandparents lived through the through the uh, Hinkley fire. But one of the things about it, it was um, it cut a swath about uh, fifty miles long and two miles wide within an, an hour or two, and it was basically a tornado of fire. The and it and it uh, could be seen from Duluth. Well. Yeah in order to see it from Duluth, you ha- it had to be, and this is how they estimated basically that you could see the fire column from Duluth, which meant that the fire column was five miles high. Ugh. So, you know, how do you even begin to explain something like that? Yeah, I have no idea. And, <laughs> and, 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 and in the accounts, you know, the eyewitness accounts, particularly of Peshtigo over and over again, people are describing the fire came from the sky. Right. The fire came from the sky. The same thing with Hinkley. People said the fire came from the sky. Um, you know, the treetops took took fire first. first. Right. Yeah. Church steeples caught on fire. And then it was so swift that and, and it completely defied all of the expectations as to how fire behaved. So typically around the villages like Peshtigo and some of these other villages, they would they had created fire breaks. And they had and and these people had been living now for decades in the forests. They had seen many forest fires. They knew what normal forest fires were like, right? Mm -hmm. So they would create fire breaks or they would have an open area where, you know, in the case of a forest fire, they could take refuge in the open field, right? So people would take refuge in the open fields and a tongue of fire would come out of the sky and turn them into ashes within seconds. So, I mean, what's the explanation for that? You know, I don't know, but, uh, the timing sure what, interesting. <laughs> what? They said the timing sure is interesting. 
yeah, right, yeah. for all of those things. Yeah. 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 The eyewitness accounts are amazing. And so I, when, when I did fire from the sky, which was uh, 1996 was a, uh, a documentary that was shown first on the, the non ex no more existent um, network TBS, but it was shown multiple times on TBS and then it was shown on CNN. So, I mean, all in all, it must've been shown 10 or 12 times, right? But it was, um, it was named fire from the sky. And, and, at that time, I didn't have enough pull to really get the focus of it the way I wanted it. So I got right. a segment in there about the Peshtigo fire and so on. Um, and that's where the, that's where basically the, the name of the, the documentary came from. Oh, okay. It was the idea of fire from the sky. Yeah. But, um, awesome. so in the course of, of filming the documentary, we went up, took a camera crew up and we went and, and explored up and down the peninsula there and up and, up and down um, the east shore of Green Bay, the western shore of Green Bay, and went to the Peshtigo and went to the fire museum there, interviewed the um, the curator, an old fellow who I'm sure has, has passed away by now, but um, Robert, uh, somebody. So he was in, in the show. Um, we interviewed him, and he gave us access to these unpublished archives of these eyewitness accounts. Oh, so wow. I made a bunch of these photocopies and started pouring through those actually after the show had, had been produced. So I learned a lot more subsequent to it than I did, than I knew going into it. But, and I'm, I'm guessing some of that is now available online, which of course in 96 was not, yeah. but, but yeah. That, those eyewitness accounts were, I mean, hair raising, just yeah. mind boggling, that hair raising in. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's your, your retelling of it is what is what sparked my interest in it. I'd never had thought of those implications and 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 hadn't heard that angle on those fires. That's why I wanted to ask you about it because yeah, it's it's just a terrifying account of 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 the kind of thing that can happen when during you know just a, a, a small interaction with the cosmic environment. Maybe right? Maybe that's well, that's the cause. It did but, happen. Yeah, just yeah. recently. Right. We'll talk about that. Okay. I think we've. Probably a running out of time here, we, but we, we could certainly pick that theme up again. Oh, I'd love to. Uh, and and I could be a little bit more prepared to address that story. That that would with be some visuals and some quotes and things like that. Um, I, I would love the chance to do that, Randall. Thank you so much uh, for your time. Yeah, as you say, we're coming up on two hours. I want to be respectful for your time as well. And uh, yeah, that would be awesome. I'd love. I would love the chance to do that. That would be well. I mean, really obviously, cool. in this two hours, we've just scratched the surface. That's, There's a lot more we can be talking about. <laughs> that's a lot what more that like. needs to be talked about. Yeah, I I agree. I I barely, as you say, we scratched the surface on some of this stuff. But yeah, thank you. That was that was that was awesome. I uh, yeah, we'll do it again. And this time, next time, we'll make sure we we get a lot some more visuals in. We didn't get any visuals in tonight, but we, we uh, definitely want to get some visuals. We should. Yeah, I will add some in as well uh, before I release this. We'll or get some background okay. stuff in. Uh, I do want to say just to everybody that's that's that is watching this too. Make sure you check out Randall on Cosmographia. Uh, on the, it's a great new podcast. I have to say thank you to Kyle and Russ of the Snake Brothers for for introducing me to you for for hooking this up. Those guys are great. You guys are doing just an excellent job on that podcast. I'm a huge fan, and all your work is at uh, also the uh, Geocosmic Rex channel. There's tons, as more as as I you know I think a few people say more Randall than you can handle. Uh, at the Geo <laughs> Geo Cosmic Rex channel, um, it's fan it's a fantastic resource, and and it's just yeah. They used I to say Randall the Vandal, but <laughs> that was many many years ago. Yeah. No, I was right. never. Yeah, sure. It's just it's a good rhyme. It's a, I, I like was it. a good boy. Yes, well, I'm sure you with, were Randall. with some exceptions but <laughs> here and there. You, you have to <clears throat> here and there. You know, you can't be too good. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I you know you. I got thrown out of both my high schools. That'll happen. So yeah. I'm proud of that. Yeah, I was ahead of my time there. Yeah, yeah. Didn't but I actually, the second high school wasn't quite as bad. But I and I did go back <laughs> um, the last week just to be defiant. Yep, go back to the graduation yeah. stuff, right? <laughs> no, I didn't do that because, look, it was 1969 and the world was exploding and I yeah, had more would... other things to, to deal with. And sure. high school at that point seemed like totally irrelevant yes. to anything that was going on. Familiar and, uh, with that feeling. Even even in my time, it was that's what it felt like a little bit at times. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure it did. What yeah. was your What was your high school graduating year? Oh, uh, this is frightening. Ninety five. 
Okay. Yeah. So. Well, I in you Australia know, talking too, to you, Ben. Yeah. So what does that what does that make uh, does that make you? Uh, oh, I'm 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 in my forties now, early forties. Yeah. And what does that oh, make I, you? Gen, uh, Gen, X? Gen X. Yes, I think I'm at that okay. at that tail end of Gen X there. Okay. In the yeah, se- okay. born in the seventies, well, so. Okay, born in the seventies. Okay, so your your uh, evidence that there is hope for Gen X. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've got one young friend who's who's millennial, and he's definitely giving me hope for Great. millennials. Yeah. But so far, I need to see a few more. There's there there is some millennials that are listening to this out there. They're gonna try to they're gonna try to hoodwink you. You yeah. gotta be thinking for yourself. Yep. Don't take anything that somebody says. And if you hear somebody saying, "Oh, this is settled science," there's a con- consensus, et cetera, et cetera. Right there, that should be your the big red flag. Yep, I would agree. Yep. Yes, I I got to say I've met a few and I've talked to a few millennials that, that are also giving me some hope for them. I know I'm not that far from them in age, but I it does give me a little bit of hope uh, as well because yeah, it's. Uh, it's a different world for those guys too. It's a different. It's a you know. It's just a the the way education happens and all the rest of it. It's just. It's. It, I think there are some some different challenges to what uh, older yeah. generations faced in that. Um, yeah, I get a little disturbed when I hear somebody saying something like you know I say something and then I see comments. So well, he's just a boomer. <laughs> I guess that's the thing. Now I'm okay, just, boomer. Yeah, that's the term. I'm just a boomer. <laughs> okay, I'm a boomer. boomer. Well, yeah. 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 So I don't know. When I came up, it was like, hey, respect your elders and learn from them because they've been doing things for decades that you don't know anything about. Yep. And you, so, you, you'll you hey, get to this age some point too. And, you'll and you will. The same and way. You better believe it. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, there's things that need to shift, I think. Um, yeah. Because I don't know about you, but I grew up, I was a country boy. So my time when I wasn't in school mm-hmm. or watching Saturday morning cartoons was generally being outdoors. Yep. Yeah. You know, summer, fall, winter, outdoors. You know, I, working working on farms. Same. Outdoor stuff, building tree forts, swimming, canoeing, fishing, camping out, yep. working outside, outdoors, <laughs> leave in the morning. We'll be back by dinner. We'll be back by dark. Yep. We're gone on our own all day long. Yeah, yeah, and and a lot of these younger people aren't experiencing that. No, they're stuck inside with fifteen screens between them and the television or something. But yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, part uh, of what I would like to do, in terms of, you know, bringing some of this stuff down to the to to the day to day level, is getting more younger people out into the world of yeah. nature. You know, turning them on to geology, turning them on to ancient history, turning them, getting them, you know, out, getting yeah. them out, yeah. get out, get away from the computer for a little while and get out. I Come would, on, we're going to go out. We're going to take a canoe trip. We're going to go out. We're going to go. We're going to saddle up the horses and we're going to go horseback riding. Yeah. We're going to ride out and we're going to go on a trip. We're going to ride out on horseback and we're going to see some petroglyphs. Yeah, we did. Uh, that's I grew up doing that at BMX you know, getting on the beer bike and we go out catching lizards or whatever. And then, you know, I grew up on the coast and in northeastern Australia, it was very small towns, country, but beach and just, yeah, outside all the time. I think that's, there's there's a, a missed opportunity for a lot of people these days, yeah. I guess. you can. Well, lot, been, there's a lot more I've distractions now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's I'd like to see more possibilities. And, and just like here in Atlanta, there's so much development going on. And basically what they're doing is building beehives for people to move into. And all the millennials are moving into beehives. Yeah, urbanization. And to me, I'm looking at that and going, okay, well, that's fine. I mean, we have high density housing, but there needs to be a balance to that, you know? And yeah. I think as, as people are now beginning to congregate into beehives, there needs to be more opportunities to get out of those beehives and reconnect, you know, yep. reconnect. We're going to do a canoe trip and all on this canoe trip, we're going to, we're going to see awesome. X, Y, and Z. We might do some fishing, um, whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I can tell you this. I'm looking forward to getting outside with you myself. I am definitely going to be there at the Contact in a Cabin 
for next year. I know it, it's cool. going to be in the Scabland, so I've I've already. That's going to be an awesome, I've har- awesome week. I've harassed the Grammerica boys enough where they're going to let me in, and uh, they're going to let you in. Yes, okay. I think I've I think I've they, managed to do that. So <laughs> they caved in and said yeah. you can go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I should have been be, at the first one, but yeah, yeah, we've got we're going to be renting a a, a, a multi building resort at the yeah. south end of Soap Lake. Yeah. We're going to use that as our base, and that's right. Soap Lake is at the bottom end of Grand Coulee. Yeah. And oh uh, man, the the landscape around there, we basically now beautiful. got the entire Columbia Basalt Plateau at our doorstep. Yeah. And yeah, oh, yeah. this, yeah, it's going to be amazing. I can't and wait. So part of that, of course, you're already got a good head start in that, but part of that will be um, as we get up to it, those who are going to participate, we're going to have um, sort of a series of briefing classes, yeah. briefing, uh, you know, where we webinars. basically. Yeah, webinars, exactly. Webinars were basically, I'm going to lay out the basic geology, the goals of what we're going to do, what we're going to see. So you're already prepped once we get out there in the landscape. That's epic. I'm really looking forward to that. And anyone that's interested in that Grimerica show, I don't think the the page isn't up yet. I think they're aiming for early January to to open that up for people to register. That should be uh, quite quite an experience. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Well, I Thanks, guess on Randall. That note, Ben. Yeah. Thank you very much, mate. I really appreciate it. Again, I, I'm thrilled. That was great. Thanks. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Much. I like the idea. All right, man. Well, cool. It's almost one thirty here in yeah, Atlanta, so late for you. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Randall. I uh, oh, you're welcome. Ben. Really enjoyed Look talking to with you. Man. Maybe we get you on uh, Cosmographia anytime. <laughs> yeah, anytime. I would love cool. to. Yeah, I just yeah, I would love to more than yeah. Just let me know. Well, I think it could only in, if we get somebody. It could only <laughs> enhance what we're doing if we get somebody on there with an Australian accent. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I get a few points in my direction just for that. Yeah, you do. You do. You get a few points for that. And at some time, I got to ask you about those spiders they got down there in Australia. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm halfway to knowing most of the things about them. Yeah. Because that, that's almost enough to keep me out of Australia. 